Yeah. Well, thank you very much to um, Anderson School Memes for inviting us. I'm Charlie Coker. Uh, I'm, as, the, as mentioned, I'm with uh, Disney Media, which is a Dutch TMT investment group, and I run the office uh, here in Los Angeles as well as in Shanghai. And um, we're very, and I also serve as an executive director for Asia Society. And we're very happy to co-host this with uh, Anderson Beams. And joining us today is also um, Janet Yang, who is uh, an illustrious producer and has had a great history in, in the film business um, and is currently on the governor board of governors of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. And also we've been very happy to have her as uh, the chair of our entertainment summit that the, that the Asia Society has put on for many, many years, um, and is, which is generally done in November, and is one of the leading um, uh, summits with respect to business uh, between ho Hollywood and Asia in the media sector. And also joining us is Mei Wang, who's the founder of uh, Beignet Sports and Entertainment, which is, uh, and, and Mei has been working in China for many years and has been on the forefront of of developing the live uh, sports and entertainment business in that sector, which is really interesting to me because it's something that that I, as a film and TV uh, finance on the finance side, um, have, has has not really been uh, that aware of. Other than when I lived in Shanghai, I was really not happy because it wasn't as well developed as I wanted to be. So um, we're here to talk about uh, the business of doing business in China, as well as talking about. Um, Asia um, and the Asian American business now in the media and, uh, and, and world as well as the sports world. Um, as you know, China, even though we're having going through some interesting tra travails these days, is a huge and burgeoning market both in the film and television business as well as in the live sports and entertainment sectors. Um, the, just, just to throw out some numbers, because there, I know there's probably a lot of Anderson people here who love numbers. Um, the box office last year in China was $9.2 billion. It was up about 5% or so from the previous year um, compared to the United States, which is the, still the number one box office, around $11.4 billion, but it was, which was down 4% year on year. Um, the, the movie business in China still is a growth sector and a really important sector for Hollywood because it is one of the, f it's one of the largest, since it is the largest population in the world, it is still a, an incredible, um, the growth in China is just remarkable. They're, they're up to about 70,000 uh, screens uh, compared to the United States, which is about 40,000. They've been growing up, they grew about 10,000 screens year on year whereas the United States has been about at 40,000 screens for the last 10 years or more. So it's something that Hollywood really kind of looks to, to as, as a growth sector. And you know, we're very fortunate to have Janet Yang here because Janet's somebody who's been at the forefront of, of this entire sector of the business. She's distributed films, Chinese language films earlier in her career. She ran Oliver Stone's bit, uh, office for many years. She's produced films about Chinese Americans. She's been very, she was with Spielberg in China uh, when he did Empire of the Sun, which is my favorite Spielberg movie, and, uh, and has been really at the forefront of the, uh, the Asian American movement with respect to Hollywood. So um, Janet, you know, just to kind of talk about this business, I mean, you really have a unique perspective on this that I'm always fascinated by. <laughs> And, um, you know, we're in, obviously, with, with all the th health issues that are going on in, in China right now, it's kind of an aberration. But just, you know, I would love to just get your perspective on the last few years of kind of where you've seen the China business going in, in the media sector and, and its relationship to Hollywood. Definitely, one has to be very, very uh, footloose and fancy free when it comes to China because here we are. I was thinking five years ago, every seat in this room would have been taken. The crowds have thinned because <laughs> it is so hard to know what's going to happen going forward. We have seen huge changes in the last several years. I've seen huge changes over the last several decades. And it's been almost this kind of weird seesaw effect because often when the business is booming here, it's for whatever reasons has gone down there and vice versa. There was a time when Hollywood was definitely looking at China, not only as a big market, but as a place for, for incoming investment. There, there were many, many Chinese investors, many Chinese companies that were making deals with the studios or investing in individual films. And there was a time not too long ago when there were a lot of robust conversations I think this at this moment in time, which is at the tail end, before even the virus hit, 
is at the tail end of a period where things really slowed down. We noticed a lot with our summit, you know, who was coming over, who wanted to sponsor, because the government has taken a, a much heavier hand in content and in media. And it also uh, really sort of in influenced the, the economics of business by, by, by you know, insisting that a lot of companies pay very, very large m amounts in tax very quickly. So a number of companies went down in that period. And just overall, they, there was a feeling, as there is here in some ways, of some of increasing isolationism. However, the market, as Charlie was saying, has been very robust. And we expect that when it gets back on its feet, China will continue to be a, a very, very attractive market. Um, ironically, when the, some of those factors I just mentioned caused the number of Chinese films to be reduced, they actually broke their normal quota. There is a quota for the number of imported films that can go into China. They broke that quota because they needed to b fill the theaters. And so there's been this massive growth in the number of screens. And so what I see is, uh, is always this interesting confluence of creative, financial, and political factors that go into what is happening in the landscape. And sometimes some factors dominate over others, but you know you cannot ignore any one of those things. There are amazing filmmakers in China. Sometimes they don't get the attention that they might otherwise because maybe their films are being blocked from festivals or whatever. Sometimes they do. There's been some incredible films that have come out recently that I think are, you know, that are very topical, that have a lot of top, you know, social justice issues, like Xu Zheng made this film called Wo Bu Shi Yao Shen, um, Dying to Survive. And it was an amazing movie that was about uh, some medicine for leukemia that was not, that there were knockoff brands, so the government wanted to take it off the market and people were dying. But then they corrected, they had a little tag at the end that said, oh, but this is how we corrected the problem. Anyway, this movie made almost $500 million in China alone. That kind of movie in this country would never do that. Yeah. So uh, in addition, there a, lot, a lot of the blockbusters, of course, go to China, a lot of the Hollywood blockbusters. So what is happening at this exact moment in time is I, for one, who spent many years uh, developing projects with China, I have found, fortunately, that because of the streamers and because of the decentralization of the business here and because of really successful movies like Crazy Rich Asians and Farewell and Now Parasite, there's a, an incredible openness for Asian content and it doesn't have to be focused on China. This, the, this has been the great awakening is that there are other countries in Asia besides China. So uh, there is really a flourishing of, of content and that's been very, very gratifying. The sadness of course is that the China, the China market, uh, uh, for, certainly for the moment, but even going forward, it's it's a little unpredictable. It's a little unpredictable, and while it will definitely grow, I think we have to really take a wait and see attitude. Yes, I mean I think that with respect to, I mean the Chinese. If you look at the box office in China, it's becoming much more localized in a certain sense, but also kind of much more diverse. So. Some of the big blockbusters last year didn't perform as well as people might have expected. For example, Star Wars, which never really had that kind of traction in yeah, China. Never did well. In China. Yeah, but but movies, other movies. Um, so there was, uh, for example, Green Book did amazingly well in China, and Free Solo did very amazingly well in China, and other foreign films that are kind of on a smaller scale and kind of more. I wouldn't say art house, but you know, mid-level movies that would you know would not have necessarily done particularly well. And this market seemed to have an amazing amount of traction. And when I, you know, years ago when I was living in China, I mean, the, there was always a, a, a kind of attempt by the government to try to manipulate so that the foreign films would stay under fifty percent. That was kind of always the mark. But but now the Chinese films have really taken off, and they're producing more local content that seems to be having traction, and they're taking up, you know, close to two thirds of the market on a kind of on a naturalistic basis. Yes, so, and I was going to add, even some films that would be considered very propagandistic or nationalistic, people are going in droves because they like it. They've been making these for many, many years, and there used to be a sense of okay, we'll go more out of obligation, but because the quality of the filmmaking is has improved so much. The, the techniques that you know have have just been been steadily improving, and there you know again up until very recently there was such a, 
a, a, a wonderful sense of, oh, we can make our own blockbusters for our people. And there hasn't been too much concern whether these films would play outside of China. Yeah. You know, there was last year we saw um, this movie called My Country, My People, and then one called The, the Cap. In, is that the English title? Didang, you know. So these are films that are that are very much, in some ways, like Hollywood films in the sense that they're they talk about heroism and also, of course, um, Wolf Warrior Two. And so I think there's there's this feeling that we don't. We, it's too hard to figure out what the rest of the world wants. We we have a big enough market. We can just do what, what we want. And yes, sometimes there's that outlier. You know, there's the Green Book of Resol because those movies won Academy Awards, so they're definitely paying attention. In that sense, um, it's a, it's a mix. It's a real interesting mix. This movie that came out recently called Shani and Dini. Um, what's the English title? Um, does anybody know? I forgot the English title. Anyway, it's about bullying in a high school. I thought that was really interesting. Um, what is the title? And I can't remember. But so it's just it's it's it's, it's fascinating. And I think that you know they there are attempts to have an art market there and independent theaters and have festivals to promote those films. And there, a lot of things are very topical. I do find that what they all have in common is a kind of very heartfelt, it's like something, it's a people's movie. You know, there's a there's a sense of the of the people that love I see. <laughs> so, I mean, so that's the film market, but uh, another interesting development I think that's been really playing out in the last few weeks is the kind of growth of the OTT market, and which is probably oh. worth somewhere in the five, yeah. five to six billion dollar range a few, few years ago and probably has grown exponentially since then. Is that, and, and there is a lot of foreign content that's being put onto the OTT platforms and probably more so than even films, because like you said, I mean, there is for the people who may or may not know here, there is kind of a, a, a de facto, not a not an actual legal quota, but a de facto quota in China. There's only about 60 or 70 foreign films that are allowed in every year, and um, only a very specific, only a handful of them, 37 of them specifically, which are allowed under um, what's called a revenue share deal, where there's you know revenue from the box office, traditionally like what's here in the United States, that's allowed. And those films are almost all predominantly Hollywood films, for not all, but predominantly. But in television, there's been a you know there's a lot of you know um, even when I was living in China, there was, I mean, House of Cards was really popular and, 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 uh, and you know, Big Bang Theory and all these kinds of American content. And kind of where do you see that going? I mean, do you see the similar localization yeah. trend or? I, I, you know, there, sometimes the film people complain that the censorship is much easier with television. Sometimes television complains it's easier with film and it seems to go back and forth. What I think is an interesting development just on that note is that a lot of the very popular TV shows are not getting picked up by the Netflixes and whatnot because you see that there's a giant Chinese diaspora and it really makes sense. And, and a lot of these shows play very well outside of China and other parts of Asia. So they, they, China is definitely contributing to the body of content that is being seen on the very, very international platforms. An interesting development just recently, that very um, filmmaker I was talking about for uh, Dying to Survive, his name is Xu Zheng. He made uh, a series of films. The first one, which was actually the first big blockbuster in China, was called Lost in Thailand. It came out in 2012. He did a series, and the last one is called Lost in Russia. In fact, we invited him to our summit, and he left us to go to start shooting that movie. And there was a huge anticipation for this movie, Lost in Russia. But unfortunately, there's no way for the movie to be released in theaters. So ByteDance, one of the biggest platforms, did just buy it for a very, very hefty sum. There was a lot of controversy about that. Of course, the theater owners are really teed off about that. And, and I think the filmmakers as well, because there's nothing like having a very you know, big theatrical release as a filmmaker. This is what we all want. This, this, nothing duplicates that. So this is hugely controversial. And does it mean that this is the, a way for the future? Um, it, it's, you know, and my work at the Academy tells me the same thing. This is, this is the big question sitting on the table for everyone yeah. all over the world. Are we just going to start seeing everything on our computers or on TV, <laughs> you know, or what films will be reserved for the theaters? And, and can you qualify for an Academy Award if you're not? in theaters and you know what's members you know just so many questions because this is obviously the direction that's going in and what do we you know um there you can you can argue i could argue both sides very easily i love watching movies in theaters but the reality is many people just don't do that anymore yeah 
Well, I mean, I think in China, especially with the younger generation, they've kind of, I mean, they like to go to the theaters to watch the big blockbusters and, and they seem to have liked to go to the theaters to watch very personal movies and even foreign personal movies like Green Book. And there was a kind of Lebanese film that did right. extremely well. And uh, uh, was it Don, uh, Dongal, the Indian Dongal, film, yes. incredibly well in, in China. But I mean, there was has always been a huge kind of digital component for especially younger people because of the kind of lack of quality television on, on the terrestrial networks and that they've kind of leapfrogged. But um, I mean, do you see any trends uh, as far as, pro I mean, so I, I agree. I think the Chinese producing better and better content and there's more exportation, but where is the relationship with you kind of Hollywood and, and China on, on those OTT platforms? Because obviously American or US companies cannot run OTT platforms. Right, so I think one of the issues, because I've been engaged in many conversations and potential deals trying to create television for both markets simultaneously. One of the problems is that we tend to watch things once a week. In China, the series go on. For, there might be 120 episodes and they show them every day. And you just can't keep up. And there are a lot of other issues because I know in China they want, they want to approve everything before it actually gets aired. And then you're going to make that much content with the risk of it not being approved. That's a little tough. You know, here it's a it's a slightly different system. It's very hard to match the different formats um, for the time being. But I, I still have hope that there, you know, I've been in conversations where maybe there's a project that's a mini here, but a theatrical release in China. Like if you did a big epic kind of a Mulan type movie, maybe there might be a situation where you could do, you know, uh, break it up into several uh, movies for China, but then it would it would be streamed here or something. It's, um, I think everyone's experimenting. And, and what I do know is that the streamers here definitely want to capture as many eyeballs as possible anywhere in the world. They, the Netflix and Amazons are not, are not, and probably will never officially be in China. Um, so, but they are, that doesn't mean they don't want to make content that's appealing to China because they know there's, or to Chinese people, because they know Chinese are everywhere in the world <laughs> these days. So, um, yeah, it's and 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 all and it's a land grab right now. All the 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 potential streamers that will be the one of the three or five or seven that you have in your home, you know, everyone wants to be one of those. So their their Netflix used to be seen for making edgier projects. Now they're they want to go broad. But I have to say they that the streamers have contributed considerably to the openness that people have to Asian content. And that has been life-changing for many of us because so many writers and actors and directors that you know were struggling for work before are, are ha you know, happily and busily working now. Very, that's true, that's very true. And I think in China, it's, it's also, there's been a big boon as far as you know the three big platforms there, mm -hmm. IGE and Yoku. Yeah, and, oh, and, and TikTok. We, and we, TikTok, we should definitely mention TikTok, which is, the one platform that has really caught on worldwide. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm not 15 years old, but if I were, <laughs> I'd be on it all the time, <laughs> as most are. And it's ex hugely popular. So this is, this is kind of a big deal. And then those of us who travel to China you know, frequently or maybe not that frequently have WeChat. You cannot live without WeChat. You cannot. And that is, you know, can you imagine one app that does 90% of your, all your business and, and that 95% of the people use? I mean, that's extraordinary that they've achieved that, that, you know, that level of penetration. I think people look on very enviously that there is something like that, that in a country so large is so universal. I mean, it's, it's astounding. And it's, it is by far the best, best app. I mean, you, you can buy groceries, make doctor's appointments, you know, you can leave voicemail, you can send messages, people do business on it, unlimited document videos, and anything goes. Like, there's nothing WeChat doesn't do. Absolutely. I could not do business in China without it. You can't. You, you, you literally cannot. <laughs> yeah. So turning to another sector in the entertainment, which is, I think, you know, I think the film and television business, especially even the OTT business in China is very developed. But May, you had a fascinating adventure with when you worked with AEG and Live Nation in China and really developing out um, the live music world and the, and the sports world. Because I, I was living in Shanghai when they first started building the Mercedes-Benz Center in Shanghai, which you were an integral part of. And I just, you know, love and, you know, it's a 
you know, the last statistics I heard about the music business, the live business is about a billion dollars a year now. It's small compared to the U.S., but their growth rate is incredible. I mean, it went 40 percent in, in a few years and 15 percent year on year kind of growth. And so we'd just love to hear about, you know, your your journey on that on, in, and, and the, your experience there. Sure. I really had the honor to develop business, actually break into the China market for three major American live sports entertainment companies. Maybe you have heard of them. One is called Clear Channel Entertainment, now called Live Nation. Um, AEG, they have actually headquartered here out of Los Angeles. So we broke into ground for AEG back in 2006. Um, for Clear Channel Entertainment, uh, actually as early as 2004, 2005. Um, and then later on, I helped another company called Global Spectrum. Now they are called Spectra. Um, they're kind of the Philadelphia version of AEG, and um, their, their um, parent company is Comcast. So my, my whole kind of career history, the past 20 years, I devoted to bringing those three major live entertainment and sports companies into China. And I experienced a lot of, you know, changing landscaping in China with them. We did many like the firsts in China. So with Live Nation, we did the first ever Sino-America joint venture in live uh, sports and entertainment ever. Um, so the first joint ventures. And with AEG, we did the first um, Sino-US managed arenas in China, one in Shanghai, one in Beijing. And I, I participated in drafting the NBA standards um, for China. So before the venues in China doesn't and really have a standard. So they call them uh, gymnas uh, gymnasiums. So with AEG, uh, we together, we drafted those standards so that um, like a global events like the NBA and major concerts can play in those venues. So we experienced lots of interesting things during that journey. Well, I, I can imagine that, for, for example, building a, a, an arena like the Mercedes-Benz Arena, which is state-of-the-art and, and, and really an, an amazing place to, to, uh, you know, to experience an event at, it must have been very challenging. And it'd be very, I think it'd be interesting for the audience here to, to hear about you know, what are the kind of governmental cooperation you had to have and what are the kind of you know, the, 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 the obstacles that you had to overcome. Because my favorite saying about doing business in China is that in China, everything is possible, but everything is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are definitely lots of challenges, especially when you enter into China. And um, actually, the, the, these are very large companies in America, but they had very little people knowing uh, what they do in China. I remember I was the first employee of AEG in China, and we had an office in Beijing, and I was the only person, so I actually answered all the phone calls. So I got, <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I actually to start with, I, lots of people call me to ask me about this manufacturing git that we did. Then later on, I realized there's a company in Germany called, also called AEG, the same name. <laughs> and they seem to be very famous in manufacturing a certain thing. So I got lots of phone calls about that, asking about the dealership um, <laughs> partnership. So like not many people know about AEG. Not many people knew about uh, Live Nation back then. Now they are very famous, very influential in China now. Everybody know about them. But back in those days, nobody knows about them. So that's like definitely a challenge. Um, but, you know, people ask me, like, May, why don't you work for some big name companies like Disney? Like, everybody knows Disney, right? But I guess just maybe I have just always um, been brought into these journeys, which just seem very challenging to me, but then just become extraordinarily rewarding for me as well. So, like, for the Mercedes Benz Arena in Shanghai, you know, actually, when we um, AEG, um, went into China, we didn't know where we should start. So we were kind of just looking at different sports entertainment properties that we could act, um, potentially acquire uh, because uh, Mr. Philip Anschutz, the, you know, the owner of the company, loves soccer. So we looked into acquiring a soccer team from China. And he loves music festivals. He had two of the largest music festivals in America. So we looked into evaluating music festivals. So it's kind of like a private equity acquisition, uh, acquisition into assets. But we looked at so many things. Then we got like blinded with so many different opportunities. And then uh, we decided, okay, now stop lo looking. We need to focus on to 
to what we really do very well, which is the venue business. And with the venue, then we can bring the content. Then we can acquire other things. So where is our venue? Where can we get a venue in China? Nobody else has done, like no other American company have done that in China before. And all the venues in China still today, 99% of the venues in China, whether it's theaters, whether it's stadiums, whether it's arenas, they're all uh, owned, invested, and managed by the government, except except for the two that uh, you know AEG now is managing. Um, so it's very difficult. So we were trying to look for, so where can we get an, a, a venue, our home base in China? Um, so that took us a little bit, uh, a little bit time to figure out. Luckily, we were there in a good timing. So we were there 2006. It took us one year to figure out actually that the Beijing Olympics is going to be held 2008. So lots of new venues were being built in Beijing. And then we also figured out Shanghai is going to hold this great event, event called the Shanghai World Expo 2010. And they're building lots of venues in there. So then we started digging around, trying to find the decision makers it took us a while to find the right decision makers. So it's like meetings after meetings. And I remember there's one day I got this phone call uh, from SMEG, which is the largest media entertainment. So they control all the media in Shanghai. They control all the um, um, all the theaters in Shanghai. They control all the TV stations in Shanghai. I got a call from them one day. They said, "Oh, we heard about you. Are you looking to work on this expo and looking to work on this venue?" So we have this piece of land allocated by the uh, government to build a theater. At that time, they were thinking of building a theater there. So they said, we were allocated this land. You know, it's a task assigned uh, by the government. That's how usually it works. So they said, we got this piece of land and we heard about you. So can we get a meeting with you? So I remember I was like, so like jumping around, so happy because we finally had a breakthrough. We found the people and they are interested in us. Um, and then, you know, we had a meeting in Shanghai actually with the, the chairman of SMEG. So, so SMEG is the umbre umbrella. So underneath there's SMG. SMG owns all the TV stations in Shanghai. And there, there's the Shanghai Film Group. So the film group uh, managed, that's all the Shanghai, the films from the Shanghai. So SMEG is really like a big, um, like the chairman is a very influential guy. So I remember going into his um, office and I, ran through everything like uh, AEG does, right? Like he had no idea what AEG does. So I just ran through my presentation like a pony and dog show through, through to, with him. And then he really loved us. He just like a love at first sight. He, he, I remember him saying, so he said, oh, you are a big company. So um, then he made some phone calls. So he got the head of SMG to, the, to his office. He got the head of Shanghai Film Group to his office. He got the head of uh, OPG with the owner of the Pearl Tower, the TV tower in, Shang in Shanghai. So the owner of OPG, like everybody, all the CEOs, like, a, like not worry about whatever you were doing, just get into my office. So he got all of them into the office. So we had a, like a very big meeting. So everybody really wanted to work with us. So eventually we actually built the joint venture with OPG who owned the TV tower. Tower. And because SMG was a sister company who owns all the TV stations, so we never had really had a lot of trouble um, advertising all the shows we later on have in uh, Mercedes-Benz Arena because we got the government to back us up and we got the, the media partners, which are very important for live entertainment and sports. Yeah, so I think yeah. I think the main one of the critical lessons is that if you want to do business in China, have the having the right local partner, especially SMEG, which is the second largest media company in all of China, yeah. is not a bad thing. It's a very important and critical thing. And finding and and I think the other lesson is that what we take for granted as 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 people who do business in the United States that we just think that the largest companies that we have, everybody should know, but but. People in China may have just never heard of them before and have, would have no idea what they are. So congratulations, you did a great job selling <laughs> AG to them. On that note, I wanted to maybe add something. Li Gong was in that meeting, right? Uh, yeah, Li Gong yes, is the head yes. of the SMG. Yes. And um, he ended up, so I, when Jeffrey Katzenberg had DreamWorks Animation, he set up a joint venture with SMG in Shanghai. Yeah. And then uh, DreamWorks was sold to Comcast Universal. And because they already had a, a, uh, an animation division, they spun DreamWorks Animation China, uh, what was it called? Oriental DreamWorks Animation. Not my favorite name, but oh boy. Um, so 
uh, what was interesting, they spun it off and there were different people who were interested in buying it, but Li Regong ended up buying it. So it's now a yeah. wholly owned Chinese company and we have a movie coming out later this year, which is with Netflix. So it's probably the only company I can think of that's a wholly owned Chinese company now mm -hmm. that is actively, they have our project called Over the Moon. They have another one with Stephen Chow that's also going to be with Netflix. So I think it's, I, I think it's fair to say it's the only uh, wholly owned Chinese company that's just selling directly to Netflix. So yeah. that was, it was interesting how the progression of that company came about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and I think that even though the, I think we all know the entertainment business is really controlled out of Beijing for obvious government control issues, but that Shanghai is probably a very interesting place, a little bit more loose and a little bit easier place, a more commercial place to do business, I would say. Yeah, uh, I feel like in China, it's hard to do business without running into the government. You know, they are everywhere. And, you know, especially in this entertainment and sports, it's, um, you know, um, the government screens the contents to make sure it's uh, it's right. Um, so we actually have to go, like, do a lot of uh, government meetings. You know, I'm a business person do, doing business development, but I was in multiple like uh, vice mayor, mayor meetings. So I, I'd like uh, to like take a moment to share like how those meetings will be like because you guys are so kind to stay here with us. <laughs> um, so it's not actually like in a meeting room. So when you meet with a go Chinese government official, which is very likely uh, if you do business in China and especially if your project is big enough, um, you probably will have one of those meetings. And um, so if it's like a, at, if it's above uh, director, maybe bureau level, so Zhujiang, bureau level, and uh, all the way up to vice mayor, mayor, maybe the governor, and then the central government. So it will all be the same setting. So for example, Janet and I are the, she's the mayor of the city. I'm going to Thank visit you. her to try to build an arena in her city. So I would be sitting with her actually just like this. Just like this, facing, yeah. you don't facing. face each other, we, you face. Yeah, face we don't talk with each other. And there probably will be like a big bouquet of flower in between us. <laughs> <laughs> Doilies on the chair, like where the chairs are covered in the cloth. And, and, and a lot a of really, tea. really Lots large cloth. Yeah. Lot, yeah. Really and huge A cloth. really big room. And yeah. the, the chairs Very are, beautiful. there's people on the side and then the main people sitting would be at one end of the narrow end of the room. Yeah. And the chairs are lined up. So again, you don't face each other. You yeah, look you straight ahead. Has straight, like, there's lots of cups of tea, tea. that they're constantly refilling your cups. Of tea. <laughs> and there are translators like uh, sitting in the behind. behind if you don't behind. speak uh, English or uh, Chinese. And you know, your people will be like, my people will be on this side, like my company actually straight like that. And her people will be on this side. And usually the people down there are not supposed to talk. Only we carry the talk. <laughs> and then she will be speaking like um, 10, 15 sentences nonstop. Yes. And then very, very formal, very formal, speechy things, you know, a lot of political ease. I'm glad you brought this up and not me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a lot of fun, actually, once you know the rule to play, you know, like how it plays, yeah. Um, also, like, um, you know, the dinner is another thing, like how you do the dinner correctly is also very important, but not sure if we have the time to do that, like we're over time. You're talking about dinner's banquet. Ban yeah, ba <laughs> the banquet. Banquets, oh, the banquet, the, the banquet thing. Banquets, banquets involve a lot of drinking. <laughs> That's what it involves. A lot of toasting, a lot of drinking. Yeah, so yeah. I think we're kind of over our time, but we wanted to open up um, to questions from the audience, if people had any questions about to any of us? Yes. So what are the markets um, within Asia do you think um, are working closely with Hollywood, um, like China is trying to, and do production companies in China work with those Asian markets to kind of jump what, into Hollywood? What Asian markets are very open to working Yeah, like what are the countries, like South Korea just made waves with Parasite. Yeah, well, South Korea, yeah. What other countries within the region are making an effort to kind of have a, uh, actually, at this point, many uh, there. I know something Netflix just made was shot in Malaysia. Like you know, Crazy Rich Asians did wonders for Singapore, Malaysia. Um, they're looking at Indonesian projects, South Korean for sure. Several companies are working there. Japanese, India is huge, 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 huge. So many of the streaming companies and even some production companies are and and studios. They are increasingly looking at all the Asian markets. So they have bases in Singapore or maybe in India and, you know, various other places. I, I do see this. It's beyond. I mean, I thought about this for decades and I just actually never thought it would happen in my lifetime. <laughs> but again, the streamers have opened up people's minds because it was very difficult before 
to imagine so many people gathering at the same place at the same time in a theater. And so everybody went for a very broad, you know, lowest common denominator kind of project. And now it's just, now if anything, people are much more open or supportive of very specific practices that are very authentic, that really, that may not have a mass audience, but enough that are passionate about it. So um, I, I, I personally like this trend very much. Yeah. I mean, either one of the dominant forces that, that I mean, w those of us who have lived in Asia and have worked in Asia, I mean, the Korean cultural business is, you know, the size of it is unimaginable for a country of that size, you know. And when I was living in China, they had a station, a, a cable channel, which was just Korean, Korean pop stuff and Korean soap operas. And the amount of, of that consumed in China at that time was just stupefying. And it has only gotten more that we have the... Now we have, you know, Blackpink and BTS and, you know, we're, we're like we're discovering this, but it's something that's been in Asia for a long time. I think also it's important to point out that America used to be the dominant theatrical market by far and gradually the other markets have been chipping away at it. So as a precursor to the streamers coming onto the market, there was already an awareness that, oh, we better pay attention to what other people like, you know? So that was already happening, but I think the streamer, streamers have accelerated that process exponentially. Hi, um, thank you for coming, first of all. My name is Demetrius, I have a question. It's probably a very difficult question to ask, but do you guys have any criteria as far as dealing with minority-owned companies, like owned by black people, pitching your, company, your country? I mean, on the investment side, I mean, we're really on the finance and investment side. We just invest in what we think are good projects or good companies that can make money. So we're pretty agnostic about those kinds of things. Okay. There's no telecom anymore, so it's mostly technology and media. And, you know, my, my sector is really dealing with China and specifically with China, but in Asia in general. And, uh, you know, again, we're, we're pretty agnostic about all those things. We're more interested in performance than anything else. So... Um, hi, um, Courtney here, hi. very close to you. Um, so my question actually goes to both Jan and uh, May. So it's interesting you mentioned about doing business in China because I was actually one of the translators behind the desks oh. at the time. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, yes. Hopefully we accurately <laughs> describe your <laughs> Exactly. It's kind of awkward, but it's, I'm glad I was behind that to not see that. Um, yeah, so I was working too. on the joint venture between Universe, like Comcast and their China partner. Beijing Tourism Group. Um, it's definitely similar experience of seeing the cultural differences and how to bring that and navigate what authorities you have to go through to get the approval. Um, so my question goes to you in terms of both streaming or movie and live uh, entertainment. So what are the, in general, pointers you would share on the future trend in both movie and uh, live entertainment to work kind of in between China and the US? Yeah, you know, for um, live entertainment, traditionally what we have done is actually we visit all the mayors and vice mayors in the cities. So we have all those meetings like that. And we usually let them point out to the partner for us because, you know, the government still control a lot of the resources. Usually they just, they just tell you, hey, um, AEG, you work with uh, OPG. Okay, um, Live Nation, you work with Gehua Group from Beijing. It's a Beijing government-owned company. And you don't want to upset them, right? And they will give you this uh, directions. Usually, it's actually pretty good. Actually, it has been working out fairly well. Um, the, 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 live, uh, the joint venture in Beijing between Live Nation and Gehua is still there. Like after 15 years, it's 15 years now. They're still one of the major um, players of Western music and promoter of Western music in China. Um, but I think these days, uh, it's getting more and more decentralized. I mean, you can still like ask the, the officials to give points, um, at, uh, some partners for you. That's that definitely still a, a way to work because they own all the resources. But I think there are major players like uh, Tencent, you know, Alibaba, they're all there, they're private companies, and they're all, also all doing very well. Yeah, so I think that you have more choices now. Yeah. On the uh, film to entertainment side, it really goes in waves, because when I think back in the 80s, I was working in Shanghai on the movie Empire of the Sun, with Steven Spielberg and Bert Lutris making in Beijing, Last Emperor. And so everyone thought, oh my God, this is the biggest opening. China and Hollywood are gonna be, you know, dating than getting married, you know? It was, it was, there was such a feeling of hope. And then 1989 hit, 
and everything just instantly dropped. And then weirdly in the following decade, I, I can't say it's related to 89, but it might be there were three movies that the Chinese deemed unfriendly to China. One was Red Corner, one was Seven Years in Bed, one was Quindun. Okay, so, so there was a complete freeze between several of the studios in China. And I, I made the movie Driller Club in that decade and that somehow, it was not officially released in China. People weren't even thinking about the China market per se. That was like one little bright spot and there might be a view, but it was complete, then, you know, just hardly any interaction. Then somehow the studios wrote, you know, some self-criticisms and they mended relationships. And, and then there was a feeling of hope again, especially leading up to the Olympics. And I would say the period from about 2000, I did three movies in China in that period, sort of from the 2005 to 2000. 12, 13, 14, I can't remember. And one was a movie for Disney, one was two were indie movies. There was such a few, there were great crews at the time. I, I see that as kind of a golden period. There was a lot of excitement, there was a lot of interest, and then China started making these blockbusters. So then Hollywood really took notice. In 2012 was, was a sort of a turning point because people thought, oh my God, a, a film in China made $100 million and the overall box office had crossed a billion. And you know, Hollywood likes these sort of banner, banner type, uh, you know, headlines like, oh my. So there was a surge of activity, a surge of activity in those years. And, and then everything just fizzled again in the last couple of years. It's quite shocking. I mean, it takes longer to build things up and, and unfortunately it doesn't take much time for things to, to disintegrate, but that's, that's what we've seen. That's what I saw, I've seen now twice in the eighties. It was a precipitous decline and then just in the last couple of years again. I think it'll come back. I mean, I'm just being very honest, you know, it's, it's and I'm not, it isn't, blame is not to be placed on anybody, but it's just it's circumstantial. And it is pretty shocking how how many people were, were excited about working with China here and vice versa from China, and then how quickly that's just, you know, we're all like, oh, okay, we're, everything's kind of on hold for now. So I don't know, it's gonna, something's gonna come back. We just don't know what exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, echoing what Janet said about it is I think that the business is cyclical in China. And I think because of the economic and political relationships we have with them, there's kind of a larger picture. But I mean, on the other hand, I mean, you know, Hollywood really didn't pay attention to China until I was living there when it happened, when, when um, um, God, I'm drawing a blank, when- Lost when, in Thailand? 20, no, no, 12. no, when-, when uh, um, Olympics? No, the <laughs> when when Cameron's movie came out, the big oh oh the, yeah Avatar when Avatar, Avatar came out because Avatar there was only one IMAX theater in Shanghai at the time, <laughs> and it was sold out for three months in advance, while you could buy an illegal DVD copy of it for two dollars in front of the movie theater, <laughs> but people. Everybody in my office, all the people, everybody was, and, and bu buying an IMAX ticket was very expensive. I mean, it, it cost a lot of money. It was like 30 or 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. And for a Chinese person, that's a lot of money. And still it was sold out three months in advance. The theaters were all booked out. It was just amazing. And I think that's the first time when Hollywood kind of woke up and said, my God, we can actually make money here. We should try to do something, you know, and it just kind of- Also his movie Titanic did very well. Yeah. The first official movie that went over on revenue share was the Harrison Ford movie called the, oh, what's it called? The, uh, what's it called? Indiana Jones? No, 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 no. Fugitive. Fugitive. Fugitive, yeah. Fugitive. And that was a really big deal, you know, so these blockbusters started going over and then, and then people got, and they really started making money. But the market, the market growth from 2012 to 2015 was insane. It was like 50% growth per year in that period. And yeah. they, and it was, you know, both because of imported movies and then China just made one blockbuster after another. One was called Pancake Man. One was called The Mermaid. One was called, uh, one was a Stephen Chow movie, a Monkey King. Anyway, it was just like this precipitous growth. And then it kind of, you know, slowed and then, it was just, just been a, a series of unfortunate circumstances recently. Yeah. But, that, yeah. but the market is still growing. It is there's growing. Sti there's still, I mean, I think the reason there's a Fast and Furious 9 was because it did, part of it was it did so well. And Fast and Furious 8 did more box office in China than it did in the United States by a little bit. Yeah, that there were movie, several examples of yeah, movies that and, did better in China. The movie based on that game, War, War Game. War Games, what's it called? Uh, Lord of War. Lord, Lord of <laughs> 
Warcraft. Warcraft. World of Warcraft, yeah. It was such a popular game in China, and it didn't do, do much business here at all, but in China it went. It was huge. So, yeah. so, I mean, that market is enough to almost sustain a film by itself, even if it's an international film. It, it can really do amazing. Well, so I think... I think that there's still an ongoing commercial relationship with China. Disney has very good relationships with, with China. They probably have the best government relations they've done. They do, and they've, the Mulan situation is heartbreaking. Yeah, well, yeah. Because this movie had the real possibility of achieving what almost no other movie has yeah. done, which is have, you know, huge box office in both places, in China, outside of China, simultaneously. You know, the whole... Their whole strategy was day and date release, meaning same place everywhere. Yeah, day and date, really. And that it's, it's, I, I really feel for them, <laughs> I have to say, because they had everything lined up. You know, that it stars Liu Yifei, who's very big in China. And even though it's an English language, it was a familiar story to Chinese. And, and yeah, this, this is really unfortunate. You know, well, we'll see what happens by the end of, of March. <laughs> we'll see what happens. We'll see. We'll see. I, I feel like um, you know Chinese people have a big um, need for the consumption, like of entertainment and culture from the movies, from the um, live entertainment and sports. You know, I think I was actually looking um, at some statistics yesterday, just trying to look up because there were several like important points in the GDP per capita for the cities in China. So, like 2005, when Live Nation was in China. China, actually, several cities in China just hit the 5,000 US dollar per capita line. So when you pass that line, you are not hungry anymore. You are looking for some entertainment. And then, um, so when we signed the, the deal for Mercedes-Benz Arena and also for the Beijing Olympics, so the GDPs for several cities like Beijing, Shanghai, just passed the 10,000 line. That's a kind of another line when people like, uh, uh, like have more money to spend and they are more hungry for like high quality uh, sports entertainment. So I think now people are getting richer and richer, right? I think Shanghai just passed the twenty thousand dollar line. We are getting closer to the developed countries. So people are hungry for contents, families um, hungry for edutainment or educational experiences and entertainment experiences for their children. Um, and also, you know, the government is building so much like infrastructure everywhere. Um, I, I think there was like 600 new theaters being built, like live entertainment theaters, lost cinemas, like just theaters for Broadway shows and cultural events. So there are so many buildings and there are hungry for, the, the buildings are empty, so they, they're looking for programming, they're looking for content, and people are looking for things to do with their family, with their friends. So I think Ch China is really on that uh, growing need. So we're still very hopeful. Um, I feel like now, even though there's a downturn, but uh, there's momentum building up. People are so bored, like sticking, uh, st <laughs> stuck at home. One of my friends was saying, May, I'm so bored. You know, I've been in my pajamas for the past two months. <laughs> So, like, what are we going to do? So, hopefully, like, things will get better. I, I feel like the, 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 moment, the moment, uh, momentum is certainly building up for our industry where people eventually, this is the need. They want to meet. They want to hang out. They want to entertain together with the people they love and they care about. All right. I think that's no, it. Well, we're thank done. you so much. Sorry. Thank you for Anderson <laughs> and thank you for me. Thank and you. Thank you, Charlie.